if everybody's ready. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome hey. to San Francisco on our original SF walking tour. So my name is Bridge. I'll be walking you around the city a little bit today. Just to let you know what this tour is all about, just give you a little preview of today. I generally say if you're in San Francisco for a short time, or if you want to see a lot of the city all at once, this is a fun tour to take. So I'll walk you through all the best neighborhoods of downtown San Francisco. I want a nice little compact tour. So we get started with some of the earliest history of San Francisco. Really where this whole place comes from, how we became a major city out west. We'll go just a couple of blocks from here into the old historic district of San Francisco. We'll talk about the early years, the growth of the city. And I'll tell you why those early years were actually a terrible time to come out here. San Francisco is filled with violent criminals and those things burning down in fires again and again. But then I will, uh, I'll tell you how we overcame some of these challenges and became a bit more of a modern city out here. But we're going to just turn the corner and walk right up into Chinatown. And this is actually the oldest Chinatown in the world outside of Asia. It's really a cool historic neighborhood to go through. And we'll see the main famous sites of Chinatown, but also go, you know, behind the scenes a little bit, show you the back streets and hidden alleyways. That's really where the history and the culture of the place is. We'll keep going through North Beach, the old Italian district of San Francisco, and we'll finish up the tour in more modern city, the financial district, and show you who we are as a people today, and what we're trying to build our city into. So you get a good overview of the city and its history and its people in just a couple hours. Now the tour, you know, I used to say the tour is supposed to run about two hours, but you'll quickly learn I tend to talk a lot. I have a lot of stories to tell you, a lot of places to show you, and I want to make sure you get all the best of it. I usually kind of run beyond that. So maybe, you know, 12, 20 or so, 12, 20, 12, maybe 30. Uh, that's about what we're looking at. Uh, and I should say about halfway through, maybe 11 o'clock, we'll be doing a little bathroom and water stop as well. So everybody can rest up a little bit. You don't have to listen to me talk for, you know, two and a half hours straight. Uh, now, I know some of you have taken these types of tours before. We understand how all this works. In case you haven't, we call it a name your own price walking tour. Obviously, you did not have to pay anything to join the tour today. So all we ask if you enjoy the tour, you name your own price, you pay at the end of the tour, whatever the tour was worth to you with cash or credit card or Venmo, whatever is easiest for you. Uh, this is how free tour guides like me around the world, mayor bills in the big city here. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask at any time. Uh, like I said, I am totally happy to talk for two and a half hours straight, but if you see a building you want to know more about, or if you just have general questions about the city, you know, you want ideas on where to go, things to do, place to eat or drink, you know, how do I get to the Golden Gate Bridge, or how to ride a cable car, whatever it is you might be wondering about. I've lived in the area for almost 30 years in total, so we happen to share anything I know about. And uh, if you want to ask something, you know, think is a little weird or rude, Please don't worry about it. I've lived here for so long. I've heard everything. So uh, don't worry about that. Uh, I think that about covers everything. Uh, any questions before we get started today? Right here. Cool. I want to give you a little bit of background on our city first. Kind of build a foundation that we'll be building on top of later on. So this city really first started to grow and develop starting back in the 1770s. This is when we had a group of explorers from Spain who were traveling up the west coast of this continent and they were setting up a series of churches, a line of missions, all along the coast of what would later become known as California. And in 1776, these Spanish explorers arrived here and they started creating the very first western buildings in the city. They started by building the church just about three miles or five kilometers south of here they built what they called Mission San Francisco de Assis. It's in what we today call the Mission District of San Francisco. And the Mission District is a little too far to get on this tour, but if you have any free time, I really recommend going to visit the Mission neighborhood. It has the old historic buildings. It has a fantastic street art and mural culture down there. And because it's now the Mexican and Central American neighborhood of the city, it has the best Mexican food you're gonna find in America. So a great neighborhood to visit. So like I said, the Spanish started by building the church, they also built the military outpost up in the northern part of the city, the, the uh, Presidio, they called it. It's kind of where the Golden Gate Bridge is today. But this area that we're going to be walking through, this is where people were starting to live and they were working. But back in those years, almost no one was traveling to San Francisco, okay? Because to get to the, the city from the east coast of the United States and from Europe, well, there were no good roads to get you all the way across this continent at that time. Certainly no railroads back then. And so the easiest and safest way to travel was on a boat. But of course, there was no Panama Canal in those years. And so you had to say, get on a ship in New York City, 
sail all the way around the very bottom of South America and all the way up the West Coast. And this could take you six months to arrive out here. And then once you finally get here, there's nothing here. Uh, it was this tiny little village at the far end of the world with nothing really going on. And so for the next 70 years after the Spanish arrived and started setting up the place, from the 1770s to the 1840s, this right here was the grand city of San Francisco. You can see there's not that much going on here at that time. Like I said, this was about 70 years after the founding of San Francisco by the Spanish. And by that time, there's still only 500 people out here, still just a tiny little speck. But you know, I don't throw a lot of dates at you on this tour. You don't have to remember a lot of numbers and all that. They usually don't matter, matter that much. This one is an important one. In 1848, just about 120 miles east of here, 190 kilometers up the mountain, a man named John Sutter was operating a lumber business out there. He would cut down trees in the forest and sell the wood to people. Well, it, the way his business worked is he had this river that ran right through his property. And he had this big wheel in the river, big water wheel. So the running river water, that would turn a big wheel, and the wheel was attached to the saw that would cut the trees up. The way his business was growing, and he was cutting down more trees, and he needed that wheel to turn with more power so the saw would chop up more logs. So he had one of his workers, and they go out into the river and dig a deeper hole in the river to get that wheel farther in the water. Well, as James Marshall was digging, he saw this shiny stuff in the bottom of the river. They went down to pick it up and wash the dirt off it, and it really looked like gold. Now, he didn't want to make any guesses. There's a lot of shiny and sparkly things in the mountain rivers, and absolutely none of it is worth anything. But this stuff looked different than they usually saw. And so they, he brought it back to his boss, John Sutter, and they tested it out. Put it out of the table, smacked it with a hammer, and it flattened out just like gold would. And they tested it a few other ways and realized they had found gold on that property. Now at that moment, John Sutter, the boss of this operation, he closed the door to his office. These guys talked about it, and they both agreed we do not want anybody else to know about this gold, okay? Because if anybody finds out there's gold in the area, what is, what's everybody going to do? Well, of course they're going to come in there with their shovels and just digging up the place. So when this whole mass of people is going to show up, they're just going to tear up the land, and it could destroy the business that they both rely on. So these two guys promised each other, we are never going to tell anybody about this gold, all right? And amazingly, neither of them ever told anybody. Now our tour is over. So, thanks for coming out. <laughs> no, of course, if you find gold, people tell each other. And by the way, that's like the best of the jokes are getting today. So don't expect too much. I know if you find gold, people tell each other. You know, James Marshall tells one guy, he tells one more than one. This secret is starting to get out. But we're still, like I said, pretty far off in the mountains. But just down the road from Sutter's Lumber Mill, this guy named Sam Brandon was living there. And Sam Brandon owned a little general store in the area. This is where workers picked up food and equipment and supplies, things like that. And Brandon was starting to see more and more people coming into his store and paying for their goods with gold. And he's asking these guys, okay, come on, where is all this gold coming from? And they're telling him this story. Oh, you know what? There was a merchant who came through here. He bought some things and paid with gold. It did not sound right. And so one day, Brandon just followed a couple of these guys to see where they were coming from. They walked right back up the road to Sutter's Lumberbell. And he walked all around the area, and there was all these guys down in the river just digging in the streams, these little metal pans. So he decided he's going to give that a try. Picked up one of these pans, he walked upstream, he started digging, and sure enough, he was able to find gold for himself. And there was actually a lot of it out there. It was really easy to find back then. In his first about two days of digging, he filled up this little glass jar full of gold. Well, like I said, everybody's supposed to be keeping this quiet, not telling anybody. Brandon, he never promised anybody to keep this secret. He did exactly the opposite. He took this jar of gold, brought it right down to San Francisco, got on his horse and rode right around the center of the city, just shouting out, gold, gold from the American River. And everybody's coming up to him. Wait a minute, you found gold? Like the American River, like one day's travel from here? He's saying, yes, everybody's finding gold. It's easy to find. You could all get rich. Just go out there. So in the next coming weeks, every single person in San Francisco basically emptied out of the city and headed off to the mountains. And as word spread within the next few years, about 400,000 people showed up in San Francisco from all across the world, hoping to find their riches in gold. So you wonder, like, why would Sam Brandon do that when everybody else is keeping the gold for themselves? He just tells everybody. 
Well, I did not mention one little part of that story. Before Brandon came down here and told everybody about this gold, he went around to every supply store in the region and he bought every single shovel, every axe, pick, tent, sleeping bag, anything you might ever need to become a gold miner. And this guy now owned all of it. And he had the one store selling the stuff between here and the gold field. So he took these items and made them incredibly expensive. Like a little shovel you'd buy for, you know, just digging in the dirt. He bought that from one of these shops for like 25 cents in those days. And then he would sell it to these gold miners for about $35. Um, $35 in today's money is roughly 800 US dollars. Just insane prices. But if you had just got on a ship and sailed six months halfway around the world hoping to get rich out here, First, you had to go to his store to buy all of your equipment and basically spend all of your money just to get started. So he really came up with this new idea. If you wanted to get rich during this gold craze, well, you don't go digging for gold in the mountains. That's really hard and risky work. No, you just dig for gold in the gold miner's pockets. That's really where all the money is. So he became the first person in the history of all California to earn one million dollars. I'm first California millionaire out here. But he is really best known for starting what we today call the California Gold Rush. And so this is really where our story begins. This is where the city of San Francisco really truly begins to grow. So we'll talk about what happened in the coming years and all the people who traveled out here. And I'll talk about why, like I said, this was not the best time in our city's history. We'll get to all that in a little bit. But any questions before we get moving today? Well, it looks like it's going to be a lovely day in the city here. Why don't we start by going just across the street Union Square over here. Everybody, big bus tours. Big bus tour ticket. Get your ticket for the big bus. Hop on, hop off. Big bus ticket. social center of downtown San Francisco. It's a great little meeting spot. This is right in the center of the big hotel district in the city. Some of you may be staying around here. But this is also, as you can kind of see, the big high-end shopping district in the city. So people who are coming to San Francisco and wanting to spend a huge amount of money shopping, this is kind of where they end up finding themselves, right in this little district. Uh, if you are interested in doing some shopping and you don't want to spend, you know, thousands of dollars at Saks and Neiman Marcus and all this, if you walk just like three blocks right down that street where we started on Powell Street, there's a great shopping center down there called the, the San Francisco Center. It has hundreds of stores at much more reasonable prices than around here. And for a shopping mall, you know, shopping malls are usually terrible places to eat, fast food and all that. Uh, they actually have good restaurants in that mall, so it's not a bad place to go. Spend a couple hours if you feel like getting away from it all. But uh, the kind of the big centerpiece of the square, you can see this big pillar right behind me. This pillar is uh, honoring a military victory the United States had. So back in the 1890s, the United States went to a war against Spain. It's what we call the Spanish-American War. And in that war, there was a battle over the Philippines. At the time, the Philippines was a Spanish colony. So the United States military was sent down to the Philippines to fight against the Spanish. And in something called the Battle of Manila Bay, 
Commodore George Dewey led the American fleet that destroyed some Spanish ships in the harbor. It was an important battle in the victory of the war that Bill did in the greater Spanish-American war. And so this pillar right here, it's kind of set up just to honor that one particular victory, the Battle of Manila Bay. All that cool text around the base of the columns, all about that battle. Which is kind of interesting because I bet if you asked, you know, 100 Americans about the Battle of Manila Bay, maybe a couple of them would be able to tell you what that was or the significance or anything. But so it's not like, you know, a hugely important historic battle. So why do you have a big pillar of it? Well, this is kind of a transition time in America. You know, for hundreds of years, you know, the powerful Spanish Armada, you know, the Spanish Navy, it kind of ruled the seas around the world, one of the most powerful navies in the world. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the United States was this growing world power economically and militarily. And so the fact that this young upstart United States Navy was able to defeat the powerful Spanish Armada in battle, it was a real source of pride for America at that time. So really that's what this is all about, is to show the growing strength of America. Of course, we like to show that off, especially around that time. But the, the my favorite part of the pillar is right up at the top. This is like, you can see the statue up there. It looks like this. And this statue is kind of uh, symbolic of that victory. You can see the statue holding Neptune's trident in one hand, a symbol of the seas or symbol of the navy, and then holding a wreath of peace or victory in the other hand. But the statue itself, this was modeled after a real person who was living here in San Francisco. The model for the statue was named Alma de Bretto. And Alma de Bretto was this tall, beautiful woman working as a model here in the city. And she was becoming pretty famous throughout San Francisco because of her modeling career. And she got noticed by a wealthy older gentleman named Adolf Spreckels. He was the president of the Spreckels Sugar Company, one of the richest and most powerful men in the city at that time. And the two of them started a relationship and eventually they decided to get married. She became all of the Breadable Spreckles. Uh, I believe at the time of her wedding, she was 27 years old and I think he was 50 eight years old. Now, I don't know how much this goes into other languages, but in American English, we have a term for that rich, older gentleman who takes care of a young, beautiful woman financially. Somebody's got to know that term, Sugar right? Daddy. Sugar Daddy. Thank you. We've heard that before. Well, when all of the Red Bulls breakfast, when she would talk about her husband or her friends, she would sometimes jokingly call him, he had to be sugar company, as her sugar daddy. That's actually where that term comes from. So, yeah, it's like a whole historic pillar, military victories and all that. But this is where sugar daddy started. So definitely this is my favorite part. But history is weird sometimes. But, but we're going to go just across over the street, get into the old historic district of the city. So let's head over this way. so that people get to know them throughout the year. And at the end of the year, the city will bring all these hearts back together and they'll host a big art auction where they just sell these off to anybody who wants to buy them. Usually they end up 
bought by, you know, a hotel, a buy them and put them in their lobby or an office building and put them in their front area. Or just wealthy people who like them and buy them and put them in their front yard and display. But all the money the city collects from this, it gets given a right to this main city hospital, pay for patient care and upkeep and administration, that sort of thing. So just trying to help out part of the reason it's in the shape of a heart. But it also dates back to the famous song about our city called I Left My Heart in San Francisco by the wonderful singer Tony Bennett, who sadly just passed away a few months ago. So a tragic loss for our city, but this is one of his legacy projects called the Hearts of San Francisco Project. Let's cross that just over the street over this way. I showed you this picture earlier. This is what San Francisco looked like just before we discovered gold. So from the 1770s when the Spanish arrived up into the 1840s, like I said, we had maybe 500 people living in this whole area. But once we found gold, all of that changed. And in one year, we went from 500 people to about 25,000 people. So the city grew 50 times in one year. The problem with this was this was not always the best people who were traveling out to San Francisco at that time. Okay, first of all, it was almost all men who were coming out here. And when I say almost all men, I mean there were about 75 men for every one woman in the city. It was a rough young male area. There were also a lot of criminals who were coming out here. If you had committed a crime somewhere around the country or across the world, you might decide, you know what, I don't want to get caught and go to jail, so I'm just going to jump on a ship, escape out to San Francisco, and start a new life out there where nobody knows me, nobody will ever find me. But there were also a lot of former prisoners, ex-convicts who were coming. Oh, sorry, watch out for the, the car coming up. This is a pretty quiet street. Uh, there were also a lot of former prisoners, ex-convicts, who were coming out here. Now, this was at a time when the British government was sending a lot of their prisoners down to Australia, and after a while, Australia decided we don't really want all these guys. The Australian government kind of rounded up a group of some of the worst of them, just put them on a boat and sent them off to San Francisco. Like, enjoy your new life out there. So we were getting a lot of very interesting people from around the world back then. Well, this group of former Australian prisoners, they created the meanest, most vicious and violent street gang that our city has ever seen. And they called themselves the terrifying name of the Sydney Ducks. Which, like, come on, you're starting a new gang to scare all your enemies. Let's call ourselves the Ducks, that'll do it. They fought with the Ducks, they worked for them anyway. Uh, but this neighborhood that we're standing in, this became known as Sydney Town, because this was the area the city Ducks controlled. This place became incredibly dangerous. Just these two city blocks, you see, right next to each other here. This was sort of the heart of Sydney Town. This area would have one or two people getting killed every week, and this went on for years. Hundreds of people just violently died on this one little stretch of road. And it got so bad, the police department made an announcement to the city. We give up. Uh, we're not going in there anymore. This is too dangerous for us now to go in there. So we're just going to tell all of you, 
don't go into city town because if you go in there and something bad happens which it probably will well we're not going to come in and help you and so this area had no law no government anything would go here so you had all the illegal obviously the violence but other crime as well illegal gambling houses and opium dens right where we're standing this became really the main red light district of the city all these buildings are all brothels and prostitution houses and that kind of thing and there was so much of this people started calling this street prostitution alley and it was like in everyday conversations like hey let's meet up for a drink i know a great place on prostitution alley and it's like this is a little bit embarrassing for our city you know because you have our main public square union square here and then this street that everybody calls prostitution alley right off the side of it it's not really what the city wanted and so the city government started talking to the owners of these businesses and they said look we're not going to shut you down, okay? There's still, you know, 50 or 60 men for every woman in the city. We know that these businesses are going to happen, but just don't open it right next to the town square, all right? So they kind of push these places out of here. Well, even after they were all gone, look, people had always just called this prostitution alley. They kept calling it that. And so the city decided we've got to take more traffic steps. They figured, you know what? We're just going to change the whole name of the street, start over. And so this is no longer called prostitution alley. This is officially known as Maiden Lane. Because of course, this is where the nice, young, innocent lady, the maidens will walk and shop and do all this. And so if you heard anything bad about this street, forget it. Obviously, this is a good place for nice, upstanding people. So just like out there, the good people in the city, let's take a little walk down the shops at Maiden Lane over this way. So watch how this guy's coming through on the street here. Again, so just be careful with that. 
so I was talking about how that part of the neighborhood, that was the red light district down there. Well, this part of the neighborhood, back when this was Sydney Town, this was where you had the bars and the taverns and really seedy, dangerous hotels. Well, if you imagine owning a bar in the worst, most violent part of a city, you have to be really tough to do that. So all these places are owned by really tough, usually mean men back then. All except for one. There was one bar right on this spot that was owned by a woman. The bar was called the Galloping Cow, and the woman's name was Philomena Faulkner. And if you imagine being a guy running a bar out here, I mean, that's hard and dangerous enough. But then you have the challenge of being a woman surrounded by 75 guys for every one of you. All these big tough guys think, you know, we can push around this silly little lady. But also 75 guys looking for female companionship, dates and girlfriends, things like that. This woman got so sick of all these guys coming in there and messing around with her that she actually put a sign right out in the front of her bar. And this sign said, the next time a man comes in here, tries to flirt with me, like ask me out on a date or be his girlfriend, tries to push me around, or offers to, you know, pay me for my services overnight in bed, you are going to wish you had never been born. Now, most guys, you come into the most dangerous and violent part of a city, you see a sign like that, you see that this is filling in a Faulkner, and maybe she's looking at you like this. Maybe just leave this woman alone if you know what's good for you here. So most guys, it's like, all right, I am not going to mess around with her. But you just know there's always going to be that one guy out there. Oh, the charming guy, the handsome guy. Oh, this sign doesn't mean me, right? And so one day that guy walks into the bar. He sees that sign. It's like, oh, this looks like a challenge for me. He walks right up to Philomena Faulkner, orders a drink from her. She brings back this bottle of beer for us. And he's kind of making nice to her, give a little compliment. And she's just sitting, staring back at him like, do not mess around with me. And he said, oh, you don't mean that, right? And he gave her a little playful tap on the shoulder. And she said, oh, you're going to touch me now. All right, then. And so she took back the bottle of beer that she just heard the day of and smashed it down in the guy's hand. Just shattered the bottle right in her head. Grabs him, pulls him over, and throws him out of the bar. Uh, not through the door of the bar, but through one of the windows of the bar. Unfortunately for this guy, he had been flirting with her up on the second floor of the bar. This guy goes flying out the second story window, lands with a crash on the sidewalk here. He apparently survives getting chucked out the window and sort of hobbles away. Well, of course, if this happened today, this woman would probably end up going to jail or something like that. But not back in these days. Everybody wanted to meet this lady, so they all came in here and spent all kinds of money. She made a ton of money off of that. But even this was not at all the roughest of the places in town. Just two buildings down, there was a bar that was called the Fierce Grizzly. And the grizzly bear is the official animal of California. It's right there on our state's flag. This was not called the Fierce Grizzly out of any state pride or patriotism. It was called the Fierce Grizzly because they kept a live grizzly bear chained up outside the bar. Uh, not like you in a cage or something. There's just a bear on the sidewalk. So if you want to go into this bar, you have to run by an angry grizzly bear who may be feeling a little hungry and think you look like a delicious snack to grab up. Like, I'm picking up these couple of examples just because this is what the whole city was like. You know, you go back in the history books and you hear people talking about this, you know, this grizzly bear bar, and they're not saying, oh my gosh, it was insane, there was a grizzly bear outside. No, they're saying, oh yeah, this bar, it had a bear outside, it was pretty scary, but they had really good food there, so we went there for lunch every once in a while. It was just kind of assumed, this is just what San Francisco was like, the entire city. Now, all of this is going on for like seven or eight years. So like I said, we discovered gold in 1848. People really started showing up in big numbers the next year, by 1849. Uh, this is also where we got our American football team named San Francisco 49ers, these 1849 gold thunders. Uh, by the middle of the 1850s, things are really starting to change for the better, though. Because during this time, we had a huge amount of money out here. You know, we talk about the, the gold rush, the discovery of gold. In those few years, we found, in today's dollars, roughly $20 billion worth of gold. And so if you imagine, you know, a tiny little village of this size, and now within a few years there's $20 billion of gold, of course the city's going to explode. So you have factories all around building up this city. You have a whole banking industry that gets set up out here to handle all this money. This really made San Francisco the, the financial center of the western U.S. And now you have people moving out here, and they're not saying, you know, I'm coming out to California to be this adventuring gold miner, but I want to open up a shop or start a hotel, or I just want to work at the local bank. 
And for the first time, people are starting to say, I'm going to bring my family with me as well. So you have women and children coming in much larger numbers in the mid-1850s. And it doesn't just immediately become a wonderful place because the, the, over the coming years, as the government gets stronger, the police force have more money, they're able to push out some of the criminals and the gangs. You start to see the city transitioning. But yeah, for those first seven or eight years, uh, this is why we called it the Wild West in those days. Like I said, not the greatest time in our city's history. But we're going to start to move to the next chapter of our city's story. But before we do that, any questions before we keep going? Like I said, I can talk all day. I can keep doing this all day if you want. But if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to come and ask at any time. Like I said, just up around the corner, we're going to go up into Chinatown here. I'm going to point just down uh, this road over this way. If you look down this street, you see that uh, that tall building in the background, sort of the, the blue building with the white top behind all the others. That is called the Salesforce Tower. That is the tallest building here in San Francisco. It's about 1,070 feet high. It's roughly 320 meters tall. Or we can cross over the, the street this way. Yeah. It's really cool because the top six floors, the whole white area of that building, wrapped all around the building are thousands and thousands of colored lights up there. So every night they do a big animated light show at the top of the tower. So when you come down here, you might see waves crashing on the top of the tower or people dancing up there. Or it changes throughout the year for different festivals and events. Uh, in the early part of the year, you have uh, Chinese New Year. And so they have, uh, they change it every year. It was the year of the dragon this year. So they have a dragon in front of the moon for Lunar New Year. In June, it's Pride Month, so they have a big rainbow flag flying up there. But my personal favorite thing they do every year is one day a year at Halloween, you know, at the end of October, this you know, spooky holiday. If you've ever seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies, they have the big flaming eye of Sauron on the top of the tower. So for miles and miles, all around the Bay Area, you can see off in the distance this huge tower with this flaming eye at the top. Of it. So it's kind of a fun thing they do. But you, it does not at any one particular time. It goes on all throughout the night, so as long as you're around here. We'll keep going just up this way. Yeah, what's that? Oh no, it's not. This is um, a charger. Yeah, yeah, it's charging. Yeah. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Where's your next de- destination, though? Oh, I'm just going to be going back. To oh, okay. All right.
Obviously, like talking about the the history and the stories about San Francisco, but I also like to point out just weird, quirky things about the city. And there's one of those behind me. You can see this big, tall, brown building behind me here. We call this the Bank of America Tower because this was when it was built in 1969. This is the world headquarters of the Bank of America. Uh, they have since moved away. So there's other companies. Now, it's obviously, technology companies with Microsoft and a lot of that building, but a lot of other other people. Uh, but we generally still call it the Bank of America Tower. Now, one thing I'll talk about is that San Francisco, we've never really been one of the huge skyscraper cities. You know, we're never going to have the tallest towers in the world, even the country. This city kind of fights against all the big development, all the big growth in our city. Uh, we People in the city have what they call Manhattanization of San Francisco. They don't want our city growing into another Manhattan with you know, millions of people living in it. And so this city kind of stays pretty small. The, populate, the total population of San Francisco, just over 800,000 people. So we're not a huge city or anything. But so when this tower was first built, it was the tallest building in San Francisco. And a lot of people really did not like it. They thought it was too tall. They didn't like the color, this ugly brown color. They didn't like the shape and the architecture. And so it was very widely disliked when it was first built. Nowadays, you know, it's just part of the city's skyline. But there is one thing that absolutely hates this building more than anything in the entire world. And I swear to you, it is Godzilla. Uh, now, there have been like three Godzilla movies made in the last 10 years or so. And somehow, in every single one of these movies, Godzilla blows up this tower. Now, this tower, I should say, it does not exist in Boston or in Hong Kong. But somehow, this building finds its way into each of these movies just so Godzilla can blow it up somehow. I have no idea why this is the case, why it keeps showing up just so it can get blown up by Godzilla. But somebody in this movie studio really, really hates this building it up to keep destroying it. You know, I don't watch the building, but I'm just going to keep blowing it up for one reason or another. But it's just, you know, one of the weird things about the city. Oh, let's go just over in the middle of the park. When we discovered gold in California, people traveled here from all around the world. And I mentioned we went from 500 people one year to 25,000 the next year, quickly 50,000, 75,000. And everybody was coming from somewhere else. Our city truly became a city of immigrants. They were forming all these little immigrant communities around San Francisco. But when the Chinese immigrants first started arriving in the days of the gold rush, they started living right around where we're standing, just within about a block of here. Now, in the last 170 years, every single neighborhood in San Francisco has changed over time. Uh, people have moved out, new people have moved in, or businesses moved in, and the neighborhood has changed and adapted. Every single neighborhood except for this one. This has stayed Chinatown ever since the very earliest days of the gold rush. That's what makes this the oldest Chinatown in the entire Western world. Well, this neighborhood has now grown to become the most densely populated community in the entire United States outside of Manhattan. 
So in 24 square blocks, uh, Chinatown goes eight blocks this way by three blocks this way. It's also one of the biggest Chinatowns in the world. Uh, 24 square blocks, there's about 35,000 people living here. So it's like the size of a small city in just a few blocks. So some of the places we go tend to get pretty busy and crowded. But this little park right here, this is one of the very few areas in the neighborhood that's almost always pretty calm and quiet and peaceful. You don't have a huge number of people around here. You don't have a lot of noises around here. And they really keep this park quiet and on purpose. And that's because in this park, this is where they honor people, who they remember people. They set up memorials and remembrances for people who were important to the community. Uh, just uh, behind you over here on this wall, there's a little plaque on the wall, this brown and gold plaque. This is honoring all the Chinese Americans from around here who died fighting in World Wars I and II for the United States. Uh, this uh, statue behind me, this is honoring a man named Sun Yat-sen. So we call Sun Yat-sen the father of modern China. He's one of the people who helped lead a revolution to create a huge a change in China. You know, for literally for thousands of years, China was ruled by different emperors and various imperial dynasties. Ming Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, these emperors ruled the country for a long, long time. Within late 1800s and early 1900s, Sun Yat-sen believed the people should have a say in their future, in their government. But, you know, he was, that change was not welcomed by the emperor, of course, and so he was basically kicked out of the country. He lived in exile for a while, and for some of this time, he was in hiding because he was people were sent out around the world to kill him, to get really rid of him, and hopefully his revolutionary ideas. But by 1911, he was back in China helping to lead this revolution that brought down the emperor and replaced it with a more democratic form of government at that time. He's a very important person for the country and for this community because he spent a lot of his time in this area. So they put a statue of him in his honor in this park where he spent most of his time. But we're just going to go over to the corner of this park here and we'll talk about one of the two most important events in the city's history. So let's go just over this way a bit. be here for a few minutes. If you'd like, if there's a dry spot, you're welcome to take a seat on the stairs or stand up, whatever is comfortable for you. But if we can just make sure there's a walking space for people to get through, that would be great. Just, yeah, open that up. So I was talking about the early years of the gold rush and the wild west. And around here, there was all this violence and crime and debauchery. Well, that's at that time, that's why the Catholic Church thought that San Francisco might be a good place to set up a major outpost. So in 1853, they built St. Mary's Cathedral. This was the first cathedral on the west coast of the United States here. But to give you an idea how important this building was at that time, this was at the time the tallest building in the entire state of California. It towered over the rest of the city at 89 feet high, so a 27 meter tall skyscraper. Uh, you can see California was not that big, not very long ago. But if you look at the church, you can actually see some of the rougher history of the city. Just underneath that clock, there's that passage from the Bible. Son, observe the time and fly from evil. Basically what that quote is saying is that, hey, if you are in this area, back when this church was built in the 1850s, we know you are here to do something bad. The gambling or the drugs or the prostitution. So instead of doing that, Fly from evil. Come on into the church and we'll talk about it. We'll bring you over to the good side. Bring in some, you know, religion and morality into your life. So they were doing their best back then. But now, I mentioned there were really two major events that shaped the entire history of the city. The first one we talked about, the discovery of gold. That's what brought everybody out here. Really what created this as a city on the West Coast. The second major event happened in 1906. Now, by 1906, San Francisco had grown from this tiny little village of 500 people to 60 years later, we were the seventh largest city in the entire United States with about 400,000 residents, all incredibly fast growing. But on the morning of April 18th of 1906, this happened. A massive earthquake struck San Francisco somewhere around an 8.0 on the Richter scale. 
a shake in the city violently enough, it literally tore streets apart, as you can see. It almost looks like a movie damage of the movie set damage, unfortunately. But uh, this, uh, one of the big problems of the city is the typical building style at that time. I mean, this earthquake was shaking the city violently for about 90 seconds, like a minute and a half of really strong shaking. And the problem is the typical building style was like this, all these red brick buildings all around the city. And these bricks, they look really strong and secure, but if you shake bricks really hard, they tend to break apart and crumble and fall down. And that's happening all around the city. So within, this is a few hours after the earthquake, you can see this is kind of the typical damage you would see all around San Francisco. You can see all these brick buildings with walls crumbling and falling down. And this is very typical. You would see all across San Francisco. But what you can also see is, yeah, there's obviously a lot of damage, but the city taken as a whole, it's kind of okay, right? Like if you imagine you own one of these homes where the wall fell down, I mean, that's a huge hassle, a huge pain. When you can hire somebody to patch up your wall and fix it up, you still have your home here. But what you can see that's actually more dangerous is all this smoke coming out of the back of the photo. What happened is the earthquake shook the city so hard that it broke gas pipes open all around the city. There's leaking gas all around San Francisco. And this leaking gas was catching fire in one way or another all around the city. And within a few hours, there's between 10 and 15 different fires that have started all around San Francisco. Well, the fire department rushed to go put out each of these small fires. But what they quickly discovered is that the earthquake also broke water pipes all around the city. So the fire department showed up at the fire, plugged their hose in, and no water came out. And they're just left helpless as they're watching, as the fire is growing and spreading, and there's no water to be found anywhere. And all these fire departments are finding that across the city. And there's just nothing they can do. And so over the course of the next day, this picture is now about 24 hours after the earthquake. This is what the city looks like. You can see just an immense firestorm has taken over the entire length of downtown San Francisco. And if you imagine a fire this big in the middle of this densely packed city, and we still have no water to put it out, there's just nothing you could do to stop it. So this fire burned through San Francisco for three straight days until we finally put it out. But after we put it out, this is now what the city looked like. You can see it's basically just gone. There is nothing left for miles around uh, over the course of three days. Like I said, we had a city of about 400,000 people. And over the course of three days, about 75% of all of the buildings in the city were destroyed. Uh, historians will compare what happened to San Francisco to like what happened to some European cities during World War II, when it was just completely destroyed. So when you have three quarters of a major city where everything is wiped out, that's what happened here. So everything had to get rebuilt. But when the fire came through Chinatown, it destroyed every building in the neighborhood, except for the church, the one building to survive in the neighborhood. So the Catholic Church, man, you gotta hand it to them, they know how to make buildings last. So this one did. Everything else was gone. But when they were rebuilding Chinatown, they made a really interesting decision. It didn't just change this neighborhood. Watch how there's some people coming through here. Uh, it didn't just change this neighborhood, but it changed Chinatown around the world. Now, if you had visited any of the world's Chinatowns before 1906, what you would have seen is the buildings in Chinatown, they usually look like the other buildings in the city. Chinatown usually shared a city's building design and architecture style. Well. So in uh, San Francisco's Chinatown, it was all these red brick buildings. But they decided, you know what, when we are rebuilding our neighborhood from nothing, we're gonna make it look different. We're gonna stand out. So one of the first buildings they created after the earthquake this one right on the corner, the little, little trademark. You can see it's got this kind of Asian style to it, these pagoda style roofs, the curved roofs. Instead of regular red brick, they use these green and gold and red colors. Uh, all those colors have a positive meaning attached to it in Chinese culture. So as we go through the neighborhood, you'll see green and red and gold everywhere around here. Instead of regular street lights, you can see these tall red and green lanterns with golden flags wrapped around them. So they're trying to make this neighborhood look more Asian, really more Chinese. Now, I'll tell you, this is not really authentic Chinese architecture. You know, if you go to Beijing and Shanghai, you're not going to see a bunch of buildings that look like this. But what they were counting on is that, hey, Americans won't know any difference. 
And guess what? We totally didn't. None of us have been to China in 1906. We have no idea what this place looks like. And so Americans would come here and say, oh my gosh, this must be what China looks like. It's like I'm visiting myself. So they would take a picture of me. They do photos in front of the building. They do drawings and all that. And it's like, well, as long as I'm basically in China, I want to buy something from here. So they go to the shops buy these handmade goods and give them as gifts. And these Chinese gifts that people would back home. I'm like, I've never had Chinese food before. So they go to the restaurants and have their first Chinese meal. And so they're having what they think of as a whole Chinese experience. When it was really sort of tailored just to them at that time. Well, because it became so popular here, they just kept people in their buildings like that. And when it, this neighborhood became popular and prosperous, Chinatowns all over the world started doing the same thing. So now you can pretty much go to any Chinatown around the world, and the buildings don't look like China. They look like San Francisco, which is a situation, but this sort of grew right out of here. So this one building right on the corner really helped create what we know of as Chinatown today. So it's kind of a cool little historic architectural detail. But that was a lot of stuff all at once. How are we still doing out there? Okay, absorbing present. Most stops are not quite that long, so you can kind of rest up a little bit. Any questions before we keep moving today? All right. Well, after this group comes through, we'll sort of follow them, go up the hill through the neighborhood. I was, uh, I was talking about, uh, you know, good photographs to take. You're like doing photos. As we're crossing over this street, this is a great time to take a picture looking down the hill. You get the cable car tracks, the bridge in the background. And also, anytime you're walking along here, Grant Avenue is a great place to take photos. You have all the red lanterns, the architecture. But if you get down here at nighttime, it's especially cool because all those red lanterns light up overhead. There's a lot of buildings with really cool night, light, uh, night lights on it. And so this is a great place to come in the evening time. The streets are much emptier as all these businesses are shut down, but it's still a very safe place in the city to go if you're interested in doing that. Let's go just over this way. Try to keep a little bit uh, separated around here. We'll make our way across in a minute.
many times just looking at the brick. I want to outside there, so a great place to get gift. And so you can go to like Chinatown and Fisherman's Wharf and Pier 39 and do shopping, but that's all the touristy stuff. It's much more, you know, the local side of it. And so any day is a good day to visit the Ferry Building, but if you happen to have time, uh, either Tuesday, Thursday, or if you're around tomorrow, Saturday is like the biggest day of the week because they also have a big farmer's market and food truck festival going on all around the Ferry Building from about 8 a.m. to like 8 p.m., I think. So great time to go out there. We'll keep going just up at this way. Thank 
This building has bathrooms and a water fountain. So we're just going to take a break for a couple minutes. And if you need to use the restroom or get the water, you can do that right here. And then we'll get fired up again in the park in just a couple of minutes.
Uh, so that's about five to ten square meters. Um, just to give you a little visual comparison, uh, let's say this square right here that people are standing on, this is about 65 square feet. So if you imagine, this is about the size of a typical Chinatown apartment. And I should say, this is not usually for one person. You usually have families of three and four people living in this much space. So you gotta have your front door coming in here and just a couple of beds here, one of bed on top of the other, another two beds right here, maybe a little desk and a couple of shelves in the window. And that's it, that's the entire apartment. It does not have its own bathroom or its own kitchen. Those are usually shared in the building. So each floor of the apartment will have a set of bathrooms and there's one big kitchen that every apartment shares. So you just get the one space. But the reason for this is because it's actually affordable to live here. You can get one of these apartments for maybe $500 or $1,000 a month, which is still really expensive for what you're getting, you know, this tiny place. But it's way less than a thousand more you spend just outside the neighborhood. But okay, what that means is let's say you and all of your friends each have one of these small apartments. If you want to do anything social, you know, hang out with your friends or just entertain each other, you can't really do it at home. You can't have five friends over at your tiny apartment. And so if you have a more western style apartment with a kitchen and a living room and a bedroom, you'll all hang out in the living room of your apartment. Here you go to the living room of the neighborhood. That's what this square is really all about. It provides this social space for people to get together and enjoy each other's company where you're not just isolated in all your own apartment. And so you come down here pretty much any day and you'll see the square is taken up by people having fun. You have people bring a cardboard box down to the square. You have four people sitting around and play cards on this box for the afternoon. And you have a kid's playground here so you have their, your families will come out. And just underneath this bridge there's tables that were built by the city for Chinese chess or la zhong. In the afternoon people from all around the neighborhood will bring their musical instruments out here and just underneath this red structure they'll be playing classical Chinese music throughout the afternoon. And so you get your friends, you get your games, you get kids stuff, you get music, you get entertainment. So this truly becomes the social center, the living room of the neighborhood. So really the most important part of the community in a lot of ways. All right, so ready to keep moving here? Yeah. Question for me, you know. I said just outside the square. Thank you. 
This alley tends to be a little bit busy, so if we can just make sure there's some space for people to walk through, that would be fantastic. So I was uh, I was talking a little bit earlier about how there's actually two main streets of this neighborhood. So the, the most of our time we've spent on Grant Avenue. This is the street for the visitors and the tourists for the most part. You know, there's not a lot of uh, Chinatown locals hanging out where they're on the shops of Grant Avenue, of course, much more of a touristy thing. But this next street we're going to is called Stockton Street. Now, as much as Grant is here with the visitors and the tourists, and uh, watch out just behind you when this guy comes through, uh, as much as Grant is here with the visitors and the tourists, Stockton Street is really for the local community. And this is where people do their shopping every day, where they're doing their daily business. Because I talked earlier about the apartments that people have in the neighborhood. You know, you have these much smaller apartments. And that's where you can start to see around here that almost every building in the neighborhood has shops or restaurants on the first floor, and everything above it is usually housing. So if you think each one single window is a separate apartment from the one next door, you can start to see just how many apartments are around here. You start to add that with the one or two or three, four people in each of these apartments. And then you start to see just how many buildings are like this. You start to see just how many people are in this community. But when uh, people, like when I go shopping for food in San Francisco, I will go to grocery stores or supermarkets and buy food for the entire week. Uh, but in this neighborhood, you can't really do that. We have just a small little place. So people go to the markets on Stockton Street and buy all the food they need just for that one day. They cook it all, then eat it all, do the same thing the next day. So there's a constant process of shopping for food here. That also means they're getting the freshest food and freshest meals available, which is very valuable. But we're gonna take a little walk along this street for a few blocks. You'll get to see a little bit of the day in the life of the community here. So let's head just up this way.
things that I really like doing walking around San Francisco is finding these little spots that are sort of hidden in plain sight in a way. You know, these little places you, you walk by a hundred times and you'll never take a second look at the building. But once you learn what's in there, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, there's one of those right here. Uh, this is a parking garage. Not super exciting. But one of the things I mentioned earlier, San Francisco, you know, we don't generally like buildings to get very big. I talked about the skyscrapers, kind of force the skyscrapers to be a little bit smaller here. But in also, all of the rest of the city, uh, in about 90% of San Francisco, we have a height limit of about 40 feet, so roughly 12 or 13 meters high. So when you travel around the city, almost everywhere you'll see this is what the city looks like. Three or four floor buildings, usually with a flat roof to maximize that space because you bump up against that 40 foot height limit and you can't go any higher. And that's what most of the city is like. Obviously, you can build taller in the downtown business district. Usually, you can build tall, uh, build higher on the tops of the hills, but almost all the city, this is what it is, three or four floors. But every once in a while, a building is allowed to go a little bit taller for one reason or another, and this parking garage was allowed to build a fifth floor. Now, because this building is now taller than everything else around it, and because we're up on a little bit of a hill, you actually get a fantastic view of the city from the top of the garage, it turns out. Uh, so we're just going to go up to the garage and get a nice little view. Uh, there's two ways to go up. Uh, just to the left of this sign, there's a ramp that'll lead you up there to an elevator. That'll take you to the fifth floor. The elevator. Uh, that is not quite big enough for the entire group, of course. So anybody who's up for a little exercise, I'll leave you on a walk up the stairs. Whether you go on the elevator to the left or the stairs to the right, we're going to the fifth floor. Thank you.
So if you're looking for the absolute best view of the city while being inside, I'm going to walk us just a few feet over this way right here so we can get a better view. If you look up on Knob Hill right here, you see there's two buildings up there flying the American flag. Uh, those are both hotels. So on the left side, the taller building, that's the Fairmont Hotel. Now you can't go up to the Fairmont, but it is a beautiful hotel lobby. If you're up in the, the, the Knob Hill area, it's a great place to come and visit. Just enjoy the indoor architecture. But uh, just to the right, the bigger flag flying, that is the Mark Hopkins Hotel. And the top floor of the Mark Hopkins is a restaurant and bar called the Top of the Mark. Now, I don't generally recommend people go get dinner there because it's a very expensive place to get uh, dinner. But you can go there, you can go to there at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 o'clock, right when it opens. The place is going to be totally empty. And you can just go to one of the tables by the windows and just order a drink from the bar or even just a soda from the bar. It's not going to be crazy prices. You can walk all around the, the area with it and you get the great 306 degree view of the city. So this is the best view you can get while still being indoors in San Francisco. So I, I definitely recommend it. And it's got a cool history to it as well. So in World War II, San Francisco became a very important place in the country because uh, you know, when you, all the people who were going off to fight in the war uh, in Europe, they would travel to the East Coast and get shipped off across the ocean. Well, for the people fighting in the Pacific, they all came to the San Francisco Bay Area. You had military bases all around the Bay at that time. They'd all get on ships and sail out through the Golden Gate and go off and fight in the Pacific. And it kind of became a tradition that when you're going off to fight in the war, your last stop in America is going to be the top of the mark and what these soldiers would do they would get together with their unit and together they would all pool their money and they would buy one bottle of alcohol you know, get a bottle of scotch or a nice bottle of whiskey or just a bottle of gym whatever it is 
and they would store it behind the bar. And the rule was, the tradition was, anytime one of them came home from the war, either when they were discharged or just on a vacation, you could go to the top of the mark and go to your bottle and get as many free drinks from that bottle as they wanted. And the one rule was, if you took the last drink of that bottle, you had to buy the entire next bottle. And so it was always a little bit risky to do it, but it just became an interesting tradition for all these troops. Well, after World War II ended, of course, that tradition sort of went away because you didn't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops coming through here anymore. But it kind of got picked up again maybe 30 years ago when people just started going to the top of the mark and buying a bottle for the troop. And so that sort of continued. So if you go to the top of the mark, the elevator doors will open and there's this big cabinet right there that's full of different liquor bottles. And a lot of them will have pieces of paper on them with little notes written where the people who bought the bottle will write a little note of thank you. So at any time an active duty service member goes to the top of the mark, they can pick any one of those bottles and get a free drink from it. It was just donated by, you know, anybody who wants to. So it's just kind of a cool tradition that they have there. It's really a nice thing to do if you get a chance. Uh, but the, one of the things you can see around here that makes a difference in your summer life is uh, one of our famous San Francisco residents, our famous fog coming through this city here. Now this is the reason we have such interesting kind of strange weather in the summertime here. Now just as an example, I took this photo last year when there was a massive summer heat wave that went through the entire country. And I know most people are using Celsius or centigrade. The numbers don't have to mean anything to you. Just know it was incredibly hot in the entire United States. 80s, 90s, 100s, 115 degrees in the Vegas desert. And then I'm just going to slide my finger across here. And you can see San Francisco, a balmy 65 degrees on that same day. You can see the one place in the entire United States where it's like, is this actually summer? But that's what it is. You can see today, this is what it is really all throughout the summer here. And it's because of our famous fog right there. Uh, so the reason for all this weather is because of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so out in the ocean, the water here is always cold. The, the water currents bring the water from the north. It's Arctic cold water down here. And so all year, the water is between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. So it's always kind of, it's not really a pleasant place to go swimming out there. Surfing is fantastic out in the ocean, but swimming, not very, not very pleasant. That means with this cold water, when you get into the summer, this warm summer air mixes with this cold water and it creates all this fog. Now this fog, you can see it stays really low to the ground, all up and down the state of California. You have this range of coastal hills and small mountains. And because the fog stays low, the mountains kind of block that fog from coming in there. And throughout the entire state, there's basically one single opening in the entire mountain range. And it's where the Golden Gate Bridge is, right over there. And so this whole coastal fog bank just comes right through the Golden Gate and it comes over San Francisco and it keeps that temperature low throughout the year. But that means it doesn't get hot in the summer, but it also because of the fog means it doesn't get very cold in the winter. It's never going to freeze or snow or anything like that. And so all year, the temperature of the typical range is, you know, in the summertime, it's going to be 60s and in the winter, it's going to be in the 50s. But you go in December, in February, you're going to have a day exactly like this. So we really have a very narrow range of temperatures. And so I actually truly wear the exact same outfit 360 days of the year in San Francisco. Long pants, t-shirt, light jacket, you can easily take on and put on. Uh, it's very easy. But now, there is usually like one or two weeks of the year where it actually gets hot in San Francisco. So it might get up into like the low 90s here, so like maybe high 30, mid 30s uh, in Celsius. But it also depends where you are in the city. Because of this fog, this is a picture taken of one moment in the city. And you can see what the temperature is throughout San Francisco. And you can see the city, the entire city is seven miles by seven miles. So about 11 by 11 kilometers. And there is a, what, 25 degree difference between one side of the city and the other side. So you wake up and be like, okay, well, what's the, what's the weather in San Francisco? Well, what neighborhood are you going to? Because if you're going over to the west side where the fog is, it's going to be freezing and the sun will be blocked by the fog. It's going to be windy and it's going to be incredibly cold. You come just five miles over this way and it is going to be incredibly hot. Don't bother wearing long pants or don't bring your jacket. It's like, it's so much different just within one city. So it's because of all this fog we have. So an interesting place for sure. All right, any questions before we move on? Everybody ready to go? All right, well, let's head just down the street over this way. Thank you. 
I like about San Francisco is you can just walk easily from one neighborhood to another. You know, we started in Union Square and went to the historic neighborhood, went to Chinatown, and now we're in the old Italian district, the North Beach, Little Italy area of the city. So there's always different neighborhoods you can really walk to. But this neighborhood really grew up strongly throughout the, the, the Italian community did not really come here during the gold rush. They came here later on in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It was mostly Italian fishermen who were coming here originally from the northern part of Italy, the Liguria region, later on from the south in Sicily. It was these fishermen that built up Fisherman's Wharf. 
Now, if you go to Fisherman's Wharf today, you'll see these big commercial ships with the whole crew on them and go out for days at a time. In the early years, it was just one Italian guy who would own his own wooden sailing boat and sailing off in the ocean trying to catch his fish. So it really has changed a lot through the years. But this neighborhood became a very densely populated neighborhood of the Italian community. But this neighborhood also really changed a lot. And a lot of that happened in World War II. You know, of course, in World War II, the United States declared war on Italy. And we had this fear in America. People were scared because we had been attacked at Pearl Harbor. We didn't know if that was going to happen again. And people saw these millions of Italian immigrants who had lived, who moved to the United States, and we didn't know what side they were on. Are you loyal to your new country of America or your old country back home? And so because of this fear that people have, the United States government passed a law. They said, if you were born in Italy and you have moved to the United States, and if you never have gotten American citizenship, you know, you're still an Italian citizen, then we're going to still consider you as being part of Italy. And since we are at war with Italy, that guess what? That means we're at war with you. And so the, the government named all these people enemy aliens, basically enemies living inside the United States. And there were laws passed about what enemy aliens were allowed to do and where they were allowed to go. And one of the big laws that affected this neighborhood is if you were an enemy alien, you are not allowed to live anywhere along the coastline of California. Because um, like I said, this was an important territory with lots of military bases, and we didn't want some enemy alien calling a Mussolini on the phone and saying when the ships were going by, you know, whatever they were going to do. So the government just said, no, this whole area is off limits. And so this community, it got really torn apart in a lot of ways because so many people were forced out all at once. And a lot of these people had been living here for 10 or 20 years. They had started families here. And the law in the United States is if you have children in America, these children are guaranteed to be American citizens for life. It's right there in our constitution. But if you, so if you had American citizen children, that's great. But if you yourselves are not, sorry, you have to leave. And so so many people were forced out of the community. And there was all this open and empty housing here. Well, that meant this became a pretty cheap place to live. This last time San Francisco was ever affordable. Uh, but the, so all the people who started moving in here were a younger group of artists, writers and poets, musicians and painters. It's this neighbor mix of very strong Italian roots and families and traditions, but then this younger artistic generation moving in as well. And that's kind of still what it is today. You go to some of these cafes, you'll know, hear people speaking Italian to each other behind the counters, but then there's people working on their poetry or writing their first novel. So it's just a, a great place to go. But one of the things that made this neighborhood really come together and have become a great social neighborhood was all the coffee shops around here. This became a really big social area. And one of the coffee shops that really did that was right behind me, this place called Cafe Trieste. Now I'll tell you, back before the 1950s, if you went to, out to a coffee shop anywhere throughout California, in any coffee shop, you basically had two choices of what you could get. You could get a coffee or a decaf coffee. That's about it. And there were different coffee beans you could have. You could add milk or whatever, but no, you were getting a coffee or a decaf. Well, in 1956, a guy we call Papa Gianni moved out here from Italy. He opened up Cafe Trieste, and he brought this thing from Italy called espresso. And for the first time in the entire state of California, you could get an espresso drink, a latte, a cappuccino. Oh, it opened up a world of coffee for people around here. And so this became like a destination for all the coffee lovers around San Francisco. I'm going to get some coffee, but I'm going to get this good Italian stuff up here. So people from all around the city started coming here. And, you know, nowadays everybody has a cappuccino maker around here, but this became the very first one. It's still kind of a place that people like to go for the history of all that. So this is a great little stop. Uh, we're going to go just uh, down the hill over this way. Talk about this neighborhood.
So this area tends to be a little bit loud and crowded, so we'll just be here for a minute. But I like this part of the community because I talked about the history of art and the artists that were here. Also, can you hear me over all the sound? You guys okay? Okay. Uh, the, all the artists that were living here in the mid 20th century, this sort of was the corner where the, the, it really grew up. And so I really like this painting behind me. This tells the story of the neighborhood in a bit. I mentioned that it started with the Italian fishermen, those, those fishing sailing boats back then. Very cool little early fishermen's work. Later on in the mid 20th century, when artists were moving in, jazz became a big art form here. So this shows some of the jazz musicians here. Huge number of writers and poets around here as well. And this bookstore behind me, just across the street, this became the center of the literature and poetry scene. So there was a, a generation of writers called the, it was called the Beat Generation that grew up really right out of this bookstore. And this is where people would come to hang out and spend time with other writers and other poets. It was open until like 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning every day, which is unusual for a bookstore, but it was meant to be a place where all these artists could come late at night after having, usually after a few drinks and maybe smoking some stuff, and having these deep late night conversations with other artists about life and love and art and the meaning of everything. You know how you can solve all the world's problems after a few drinks at 2 o'clock in the morning? That's what was going on in that bookstore. But it was really working to feed their art and their, and their work, so it just became a really cool place to visit. But the, it, the last thing to point out, we can't really see it from where we're standing, but uh, just across the street, as we go across this way, you'll see an original piece of art from the British graffiti artist Banksy over here. So if you look at the white wall just across the street, you'll see this original Banksy art as we go down the corner. So as we cross, if you look up on that white wall, you see this Banksy painting that happened. It came about 15 years ago. Uh -huh. across this road. I like this building just behind me, this green flat iron style building. This was created right around the time of the 1906 earthquake that destroyed everything. So this one just barely survived that earthquake. But it was made out of copper, but the building was designed and turned green like this. Uh, but one of the things that you'll see if you're walking around San Francisco at all is uh, one of these cars is kind of driving by us in a second with all this electronic gadgetry up at the top. 
Uh, one you might uh, notice is what the cars are usually missing is a driver. Uh, this is one of those companies that's testing out driverless car technology. Uh, so that's a company called Waymo. It's owned by Google. Uh, there's a, but there's a few different companies that are testing out these driverless cars all around San Francisco. Uh, so that's Waymo. There's also a company called Zooks. I think they're owned by Amazon. I'm not sure. Uh, a company called Cruise. It's owned by General Motors. A couple of these companies. But if you, if you feel like doing it, uh, Waymo is the only company that so far is now allowing driverless taxi service. So you can download the Waymo app and have a driverless taxi come and pick you up and take you elsewhere. And it's a very interesting experience, for sure, having this driverless car come and pick you up and then drive off. Uh, it is, uh, it's about the same cost as an Uber, and so, you know, you can go to all the places, most of the places around San Francisco. Uh, it takes a little bit of, uh, it takes a little longer to get there than a regular driver would, because they don't break any laws. Uh, they don't go above the speed limit. They stop completely at every stop sign, and they're very conscientious allowing people to merge in and walk in front of them, but a very interesting experience, for sure. I think that's just across the uh, Waymo just opened it up to the public. It was about like two weeks ago they started allowing drivers to come back to their The first Thursday yesterday. Were you the first Thursday? I had back like that. weekend or is it
And it's like every building is just this bland gray concrete square. They all look the same. Nothing really interesting about them. And the city didn't want that to be what our city looks like. And so they created this 1% arts and crime where every new building is, is, uh, has to add something to the city. And so if you go around the Salesforce Tower in the more modern business district, all those new high-tech uh, office buildings, every one of them looks unique and interesting. You may not love every one of them, I don't like all of them, but every one of them adds something to the character of downtown. And that's really what we truly care about in San Francisco, because we've never tried to be the biggest city in the world, the fastest, most efficient, most business friendly, whatever. We've always tried to make this a great place so you can enjoy to live and to visit. So something I really love about the city, and hopefully you can as well if you get to explore it a bit more. But this is also going to be the end of our tour today. Hey, so thank you all for coming. Thank I'm going to be telling you some things about my city. Hope you learned a little bit, maybe had some fun along the way. Uh, if you have any questions about anything we've talked about today, or if you need directions to your next stop, suggestions on where to go, happy to stay after and chat with you.